Thank you, Mukalika. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, the British Library. It's wonderful to be back, albeit in this slightly truncated uh, form, uh, an amuse bouche rather than a multi course feast. But uh, uh, there will be uh, many more courses available online. Uh, those of you who are here in person uh, can encounter your, your, your main course, your entree, your puddings, your cheese, your port, or maybe your talis and your, uh, uh, and your gulab jamuns. And, uh, 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 <coughs> Uh, and many other delicious, tasty uh, um, uh, offerings online. Uh, the um, British Library remains an extraordinary place uh, from which to um, project these discussions and um, these sessions. This year marks, as Sanjoy and Namta said, 75 years of Indian independence. And there's probably no place outside India where you could gather in one place the documentation uh, for that period um, better than in the British Library. Even more so, uh, the, uh, the whole story of the independence movement, the, uh, uh, the struggles of Gandhiji and Nehru and uh, Subhas Chandra Bose uh, and Jinnah uh, and all the others um, uh, on the path to independence. And then beyond that, uh, allegedly, the British Library has 35 miles of documents of the East India Company uh, sitting uh, deep, deep into the uh, ground. I've never been allowed down there. I might try and get Jamie to, uh, uh, to give me the skeleton key at some point. But uh, uh, I have called up uh, over 20 years many of the documents. And it's an extraordinary feeling sitting in the reading room at the top of the British Library, where I've worked for many years. Uh, and it's as if when you, when you press your enter and you, you send off your request from the vaults, it's as if the whole of Indian history is sitting there sort of compressed down like a reverse TARDIS uh, into a sort of, uh, into a tiny box. All the bars and parades and festivals and victories and defeats and looting and pillaging and, uh, and all the other uh, conspiracies and shenanigans and artistic masterpieces, all there sitting in the vaults to be called up at will. Um, it's an extraordinary sensation just being able to order this stuff up uh, and to read it in one place. And it makes it a very, very suitable session for us to examine both Indian history and in literature uh, and uh, other manifestations of Indian civilization and culture uh, here uh, in the British Library. The pandemic has obviously taken its toll of all live arts everywhere in the world, but we were very quick on to live events and Zoom. Uh, and within two weeks of the lockdown, uh, we had our Brave New World sessions, which, um, as Sandra just said, reached an astonishing 30 million viewers across the world in some very unlikely countries. Who knew that Uzbekistan uh, took a close eye on Indian literature? But there we go. Um, and um, none of it, of course, quite matches the sensation of arriving at the Jaipur Festival proper. And those of you here are warmly invited next January, where we are attempting to put on a full festival again in Jaipur, uh, uh, albeit um, probably uh, slightly smaller than usual. Uh, and um, it should run, I, mean, I don't know whether we'll get our, uh, our usual figures of, of, of half a million, but uh, uh, it, and, and the sensation of being in a kind of literary Glastonbury, but it is hopefully going to happen in person. Uh, and you are all warmly invited. Namata has already outlined uh, the festival, but um, some of the some of the events. But uh, it is, a, I hope, a, a, a balanced um, uh, uh, starter course um, with some of the great names of Indian literature, um, particularly cutting-edge writers such as uh, Jeet Tyle, uh, author of Narcopolis. Um, Taran Khan, the new star of Indian travel writing, who won the, uh, uh, the big travel awards this year across, uh, across the board. Uh, also, major writers from the region, such as Elif Shafak and Tamina Anam, as well as foreign writers who've, who've dealt with India and Indian culture, um, such as Edmund Richardson, who's extraordinary. Alexandria is one of the great um, non-fiction successes this year. Kat Jarman, whose book on the Vikings amazingly traces uh, an object found in a Viking grave in Derbyshire back to Ahmedabad uh, as a measure of the uh, trading links of the time. And finally, uh, Kim Plofka, uh, who is one of the great uh, uh, scholars on 
Sanskrit mathematics and the extraordinary world of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, zero uh, decimal place system and so on, all the things that we take for granted that uh, uh, in Europe we tend to call Arabic numbers, but which of course originated uh, in India uh, and is one of the great gifts of Indian civilization to the world. Every time that we pull out our phones or open a computer keyboard and press a digit, uh, we are using an Indian invention. Um, I'm going to, I think, welcome straight on board now the Afghan session speakers. We have uh, some, uh, such as Saad and Shazia, um, uh, here live. Others, uh, such as Rory and Gautam, are sitting in the studio. Uh, one in New Delhi, one in Yale, but both, we hope, are awake and present. So, uh, Shazia and Saad, if you want to come up to the, the stage, we will <laughs> endeavor to bring the world together. <laughs> So just a brief introduction to our speakers on this uh, panel. Uh, Rory Stewart is a senior fellow at Jackson Institute at Yale. Uh, Stewart was a UK Secretary of State of International Development, where he doubled the UK's investment in international climate and environment. He's the author of four books, The Places in Between, Occupational Hazards, or The Prince of the Marshes, Can Intervention Work, and The Marches. Saad Mohseni, co-founder and chairman of Mobi Group, has brought top-tier news and media content to emerging and frontier markets over the past two decades. Mohseni launched his first network in Afghanistan in 2002 and has developed Mobi Group into one of the fastest growing diversified media companies in South and Central Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Shazia Haya Ahmadzai is an Afghan journalist who has not only just emerged from quarantine following her dramatic escape from Kabul. She has reported for the BBC's Pashto service and presented a hard talk television show, Open Jirga, from Kandahar in Taliban heartland earlier this year. Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay served in the ministries of external affairs and defense of India and as India's ambassador to Syria, Afghanistan, where he also reopened the Indian embassy in Kabul uh, after the ouster of the Taliban in November 2001 and Myanmar, respectively, from 2005 to 2016. He's also graduated from the National Defense College of India and worked in Afghanistan as a visiting fellow at Carnegie uh, in, in Washington. He's currently senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Uh, William Dalrymple can be introduced properly. I'm sure you all know more as much as I do, but he's, of course, the best-selling author and has won many awards, including the Wolfson Prize for History, the Hemingway, the Thomas Cook, and the Duff Cooper Memorial Prize. His most recent books are The Company Quartet, in that very handsome set, The Anarchy, Relentless Rise of the East India Company, and Forgotten Masters, Indian Painting for the East India Company. Uh, William Dalrymple is, of course, one of the founders and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please now welcome all of them to this uh, panel, which many of you So what I propose to do is to start by talking to Saad and Shazia about what has happened in Afghanistan over the last month. Both were there. Uh, in the immediate run-up to the Taliban takeover, Saad rushing in before, between uh, trying to persuade Washington to take things more seriously, visiting the State Department and trying to turn the course, the tide of history backwards, sadly, without much success. Uh, Shazia was sitting on the ground in Kabul uh, and has only just made it uh, to Britain and out of quarantine. So maybe to start with you, Saad, could you paint the picture. You were in and out of the presidential palace. You've known Karzai and Ashraf Ghani very well. You've been a major player in Afghanistan, helped set up uh, the Tolo network um, and Mobi. Um, tell us what, the, what it was like uh, the last days of the regime. Were they aware of what was happening? Was there a sense that uh, this was inevitable or were they living in, in another uh, land of their own imagination? Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Will. Well, it, it, uh, it was a, an accident happening in slow motion, and um, it was all avoidable, and this is the sad reality. I'm not going to dwell on whether it was the right decision to pull out or not. I will let Rory and Gautam uh, t talk more about that. But uh, once the decision was made, actually even before that, um, there was this, 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 I think 
it seemed inevitable that they would disengage. The question was how quickly. Um, and what was, what was obvious, and I've been going to Washington since 2002, is how they did not, they, they had this, 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 this attitude of not wanting to engage. Um, so I think I went to Washington on three occasions, the last one in late July. But the previous two, two occasions, uh, I couldn't even get people to, to meet with me uh, at the State Department and the White House. I mean, partly because uh, key appointments had not been made or people had not been confirmed by, uh, by Congress. But it, it, uh, there was this feeling that they just, they, they had had enough of Afghanistan and they felt that there was no need for them to fully engage. Now, after the decision was made, and it's a monumentous decision to pull out after 20 years, you have to worry about the transition from uh, US to Afghan forces. You have to think through how to evac evacuate translators and other people associated with not just the US, but uh, international forces. But this lack of engagement was, was, was extraordinary. And I, I, I recall this discussion I had with a friend in, in Washington who said, you know, they should be having biweekly meetings at the deputy principal's level in, uh, at the White House to manage this, 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 this huge um, endeavor. And I recall uh, George Packer writing about the translators in Vietnam, and, he, and this was in, probably in late April uh, or early May, saying that it, what an important thing it was for the Americans to, to what they did post-Vietnam. They accepted 300,000 odd Vietnamese. And his worry was, um, the White House, and he told me a story that in the 1970s, when they were attempting to get the Vietnamese out of Vietnam, there was one particular individual who stood against very firmly uh, letting these people into the U.S., and that was a young Senator Joe Biden. Now, he eventually relented, but the fact that, you know, a lot of people say, well, Joe Biden has no empathy. I mean, it, you know, he certainly doesn't have much empathy when it comes to the Afghans, but it's not an age thing. He's always been like this, it seems. And George's concern, and I think he wrote for the Atlantic in early uh, May, or uh, it may have been late April, was that he would not care enough and do enough to get these people out. On the transition, I mean, it's, uh, again, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but it's like giving the, 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 the keys to the car and the car without any wheels. By, by deciding to leave and then telling all the contractors, you must leave as well, because we can't afford to have you killed or get kidnapped, we, uh, they, they built a military in the mold of the US military, right? So reliant on contractors in terms of servicing and maintenance of equipment, logistics, even the planning and, you know, of, of the military was handled by the US. And of course, they continued to receive APA. They took those four things away from them. And so the Are these weapon systems that basically cannot be operated without contractors? No, no, but by, when the contractors moved out, they even took out missiles because as per their contracts, with the US military, they had to even remove some of those missiles and software systems as well. So the, the Afghan, and of course every single day, by, uh, Blinken or, or Biden or someone who announced, we're leaving, the trans translators are coming out. It's a bit like uh, telling your partner, uh, I think we, I'm gonna leave you in the next 12 months, and then getting surprised that she leaves you the next week. So no one's gonna fight for this, for this government if they know they're gonna get abandoned. So this was on the on the on the. And this, and this thing we read in the papers that when they abandoned Bagram, they left the vehicles on the ground, but took the keys. destroyed them, oh. or left them on the, you know left them there. And I mean, why would you leave? Why would you take out your military before you take out the civilians? And they were out by June, by the way. They were out by June. It's it's. I mean, when you have these discussions today, the military did its thing. The intelligence guys were doing their own thing. The State Department has completely disconnected what was going on. You know, the majority of the translators apparently are still in the country. You know, the banana merchant managed to get out. Some uh, truck driver from Peshawar managed to get out because people they were not checking documentation. So that's why the Americans right now. You know, basically, they're, they, they have hostages inside the country, and this is the way they're negotiating with the Taliban. And it's going to be very difficult for them. But getting, I, I just want to quickly talk about the Afghan side. I met with folks in the White House and the State Department. I flew into uh, Kabul. I met with Ghani twice. Um, and I, when I left Kabul, I said, we're, I mean, there's no hope, because we, we're dealing with two inept, disconnected presidents, one in Washington, one in Kabul. 
completely disillusioned, disillusioned, uh, dis I mean, the, the, the delusional, uh, beyond belief. And, and I told you the story that uh, I met Ashraf on the 24th, just before his uh, call with Biden, and he had a stool in front of him. And, you know, being with Ashraf, as you and Rory know, well, I'm not sure about Gautam, that you either get lecture, uh, lectured or get screamed at, uh, at least at you, both. Well, at least you and I have not been called a donkey. <laughs> I'm like Rory. <laughs> UPN on Afghan television uh, with a split first with with Ashraf Ghani calling you a donkey and then appearing with him live. Is that right? Or? That, it was absolutely wonderful. If you can now hear me, Willie, it was a, a wonderful moment. He he did an entire TED talk uh, as part of his presidential campaign in which he called me a son of a donkey. Oh, son of a donkey. Yeah, that's quite, by the... quite rude. <laughs> quite rude enough. But, but shortly thereafter, he then came to see me in London. I was the Minister for International Development, and I had to give him a 400 million pound check for Afghan development. So there was wonderful <laughs> fun with the Afghan media cutting him, calling me a son of a donkey, and then politely sitting with me to take development aid. I remember that trip. But anyway, so he, um, so I went to see him, and I explained to him that, you know, that, that, that you, need, you need to bring some changes. And and he had the stool in front of him, um, and I wasn't sure what it was for, but he then proceeded to say, uh, do you mind if I stretch my legs? I'm he's the president, what are you going to tell him? And he put his feet up, just, you know, facing me. Which in both India and in, both India and in Afghanistan All is not of the Asia. way... Yeah. It's the, not the done thing. I mean, I, I don't care about those sorts of things, but I felt this man has no idea. And then the next day when, when I met him, he still had the stool <laughs> next to him. But anyway, so we, we, I think and, throughout and again, his presidency. The, give him a picture of this man. He's, I mean, he's, Karzai had, for all his flaws, had enormous charm, would welcome people yeah. in and, and operated a big tent. But Ashraf, you, you, you've always felt alienated he, people and was he, rude to them. He was only good at one thing, alienating people, <laughs> right? And he's a lonely man today. I suspect his wife is with him, but I think everyone else has abandoned him, including his, his closest aides. They're probably all over the world, but not in Abu Dhabi where he is. Um, and the reason why the military, I think, fragmented was also because he, he completely politicized the, uh, the Afghan National Security Defense Forces, but also regional um, uh, power brokers, warlords, militia leaders, religious leaders. So when a, when a battalion in the northeast is there, they rely on local support. And if they don't have that local support, they're not going to fight. Before we come to Gautam and, and Rory, Shazia, maybe you'd just like to tell your story of the last week, your, your last weeks or, or, or days in Afghanistan and how you left and, and how it was to come here. Well, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, actually, I have a, my story is so long. I don't know from here. I should start, <laughs> but first of all, I want to thank the British government uh, for for saving my life. Actually, thankfulness can never be enough, as a British government prevented me from there from dying there in Afghanistan. Well, my name is Shazia Haya. I am the daughter of my mother, Zebel Nasa. Actually, uh, they are in Afghanistan. Uh, nobody mentioned his or her or, uh, mother's sister's or wife's name publicly. It's uh, considered taboo. And I think that's uh, the reason behind the lack of identities of women there in Afghanistan. But for myself, my identity in my mother's name, and uh, I am proud of it. In my six years career in journalism, I reflected the voices of others, but today I want to speak uh, for myself. I want to speak what I was going through just as a normal Afghan girl, not as a journalist, please, just as a normal Afghan girl. I want to speak about the tough life which I had in Afghanistan with a fell off Kabul, the aspirations of Afghan people were destroyed. The day of collapse of Afghan government reached in Kabul, and the life of Afghan people was halted just as a sudden storm comes and destroys everything. Our life was also being destroyed, and we could do nothing about that. That much we were hopeless, and it really hurts. It really hurts. Please pray for Afghanistan. Please pray for the people that now they are 
in Afghanistan. I, I have fought for my rights against my conservative family, male-dominated male society. For years and years, somehow I survived. I tried to make life there, but just in one day when I saw insurgents on the road in, in front of the building where I lived. So I was thinking with myself that, okay, Afghan women have fought for their rights in past 20 years against families, against society, but, but what about now? Now how Afghan women can fight when insurgents, when they are standing on the streets with guns. So on that moment, my old dreams vanished. It really hurts when, when you make a life for yourself and just in one day, everything was taken from you and you could do nothing about that, it really hurts. Let me tell you that Afghan women in past 20 years have really, really, really hard fought for their life, for their freedom, for, for, for their, even for their even more basic rights there in Afghanistan. Let me tell you how. The male members of my family were not in support of us pursuing education, but just by the support of my mother, I went, I went to school, I was able to get uh, 12 years of school education. And then again, those male members of my family wanted me to get married, but I struggled for my education. I got my bachelor's degree by my own money in Kabul. But when, for the first time when I entered to the world of media, my father, my brothers, my uncles, even some of them now live abroad and have a modern life were against my job as a journalist. Even now they are against my job. My father used to tell me that if somebody asks you that who is your father, please do not mention my name because I don't want that somebody knows. So this is the story of every Afghan did, woman, did that change because you were a, a senior presenter on no. Afghan television? Did, did your father become proud no. of you? No. My f I, I, I had a hard talk show there in Afghanistan. And uh, 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 it was live in social media. Every day when I came to my home, so uh, I had a hope that, okay, my father will come and uh, will say something good about my show. And he came and every day, oh, again, you were live on social media. Oh, again, people saw you. Oh, again, you will, your relative will talk about you. So this was the story. We struggled, we fought, somehow we survived. But just in one day, everything was taken from us. Why? Why we should suffer that much? Shazia, talk about the... The, the, the process of actually getting out of... You saw the insurgents on, on the road. Yeah. How did you manage to get to the airport? We all saw those pictures on the media of, of, of the Taliban yeah. stopping people getting into the airport and so on. Maybe tell your story. Well, it, it was just like a movie. On 21st of August, 10pm, uh, I received a call from FCDO and uh, they told me that I should uh, go to the airport. So I wore burqa because uh, I was working uh, in TV and uh, I should uh, hide my face. So I, I wore burqa. My father was not with me on that night. I called my father that I need a taxi or I need your support because uh, I want to, to go to the airport. Uh, my father said that uh, I can't help it because my, maybe my, my, my life is also in danger. So by my own uh, self, I took a taxi, wore burqa, went to the airport. But uh, uh, on the way, I, I, I tried to enter first uh, to the airport, but there was insurgents. So uh, I, I request one insurgent that, uh, to let me in, but uh, he shouted, he cursed me and said that I go home. Actually, uh, I said lie to him that inside the airport, my husband there. 
and he's waiting for me. I, I didn't say that I'm a journalist, please, please let me in. Inside there, my husband there, yeah, please let me in. He cursed me that, oh, in one day you find husband, stupid girl, go home. So I, I took uh, sideways, side roads, and uh, I contacted uh, some colleagues. They were already there near to the Baron camp. And uh, with the help of uh, one driver, I, I never forget uh, him. I just uh, told him that uh, I will pee you. Just help me in finding way because uh, uh, I was there at, at 1 a.m. So I said that uh, I don't know the way. Just help me and find the way that I, uh, I entered the Baron camp. He helped me. And thank you so much. I don't know entered, where he is. Entered to what, Baron? Yeah, near, there, there was a side... Uh, a side road uh, in front of the Baron camp. Uh, so, uh, if, yeah. Yeah, near to the so airport. Ba ba actually. Baron camp was yeah. the, the hotel that was run by the British military to do their evacuations from right. near yeah. the airport. Yeah. So, uh, I reached there. Uh, there were my some colleagues, and then the, uh, somehow uh, uh, on, with, with crowded. Somehow we, we made it and we entered to the Baron camp and then we show our ID and the British troops helped us. So that was it. Yeah, thank you. And then, and then you got onto a plane and what was it like arriving here? You'd never been to Britain before? No, no, no. It, it, it's actually, it's my, my first time here. Uh, actually, now I have two birthdays. <laughs> one when my, my mother <laughs> gave birth to me and the second one on the... 24th of August, when I came to London. So I have two babies. Thank you. Gautam, um, yeah. you, you had the great responsibility of opening the Indian embassy uh, in Kabul after the fall of the Taliban. What does it feel like now personally for you, before we talk about the wider geopolitical picture, to see what's happening now? Right. So, um, well, uh, thank you, uh, William, and good afternoon. And you know, greetings to all my fellow panelists. Lovely to see them again. I'm great. I'm very envious of all of you who are actually sitting in the British Library. Uh, but let me go back to November 2001. November 2001, when we landed, we landed in Bagram. It was like a phantom airport. Uh, we had given our call signs. We had given notice to the U.S. Uh, military as well as to uh, the, the Afghan authorities at that time, which were the Northern Alliance. Uh, but there was no acknowledgement of the flight. And our aircraft circled the airport. And then the commander of the flight basically gave the, uh, you know, the orders to land. For about half an hour, there was no one to be seen. Uh, this was still, this was Ramzan uh, that year, 2001. And the atmosphere was generally subdued, but uh, I would say generally also extremely uh, relieved and happy. Uh, there was not the kind of bursts of gunfire, the attacks at the airport that we saw in the transition from uh, the Ghani government to the Taliban. Uh, so that was the most notable thing. The first gunfire that we heard was when actually Eid took place on, uh, in December 2001, celebratory gunfire. So whereas uh, the, you know, the Islamic Republic was welcomed in due course, of course, four years down the line, three years down the line, with, uh, with uh, relief and with celebration, uh, uh, the new Taliban, uh, what I call actually Taliban 3.0, and I'll explain that why, uh, uh, has been greeted with terrorist attacks at the airport that killed close to 200, 200 Afghans, as well as uh, a large number of U.S. Uh, military forces. And that attack has been attributed to the IS, which means that there is a likely rift. I mean, there is a rift between uh, the Taliban and the IS. What does it tell us about the future? So I think that is what is the main difference that I see. In 2001, the Taliban melted away, but there was no violence. Even Taliban 1.0 was not yet a terrorist force. It was an ultra-conservative religious militia led by a pious mullah. But 2021 is entirely different. What we have seen is the Taliban being more or less hijacked by the Haqqani network, which was a separate network that predated the Taliban, and assuming control over that. Uh, a Haqqani network that has known ties to the Al-Qaeda, that possibly, at least there are reports of links with the ISK, elements of the ISK, 
There are reports of other links between uh, the IS and the LET and other elements of the Pakistani intelligence. Uh, so what we are looking at is something that is a very complex phenomenon. We have, of course, what we have seen, an entire generation seeking freedom, seeking liberty that just Shadia just spoke about. Uh, we have a resistance building up, a resistance that could take any number of ethnic fault lines. Uh, we have uh, friction within the Taliban between different factions. We have possibly frictions coming up in future between the, uh, uh, the Taliban, elements of the Taliban and the IS, IS, ISI. And we also have this larger clash that is going on between the Taliban uh, involving also other, many other groups. There are close to 20 to 30 other groups, extremist, radical, and some terrorist groups involved. Could in you Afghanistan just, just say, I'm intrigued, because what, what you yeah. just said I haven't heard, that there are already signs of tension between the Taliban and the ISI. Uh, well, there have been some reports, by the way, I think the uh, sense of grievance, the sense of chafing against the ISI has always been there, but they have never been able to express it in any action. Uh, you know, if I give you the example, Mullah Baradar was caught in a sting operation and in jail in Pakistan for eight years when he was virtually broken down physically and psychologically, only to be revived for the US Taliban talks. But we have never heard a whimper or a squeak from the Taliban about the mistreatment uh, of Mullah Baradar. There were other commanders, uh, uh, serious commanders who were killed in Pakistani custody. Uh, Mullah Umar was dead for two years before his uh, death was publicly revealed. We have never seen any complaints uh, by the Taliban. Mullah Habatullah has been unknown. The world has been dealing with Taliban spokespersons and at the most a deputy leader, Mullah Abaradar. Uh, where in the world have we had a, a kind of headless government to be, which finally surfaced only uh, when Kabul was taken over? And even then, we have not yet seen Mullah Habatullah Khunzada. Do you, Who is controlling the strings? Do you think it's, in a sense, an optimistic sign that we've got such a completely unrepresentative government, which is entirely Pashtun, when the Pashtuns only make up 40%, which is all male, which is rural guys from the boonies, generally pretty ill-educated, um, and, um, uh, and, and obviously no women, and very, very few minorities. Um, do you think that basically means it's a highly unstable government which will collapse, or is that too optimistic? Values of what we generally regard as a kind of free world, uh, even as uh, you know, there are other kinds of constellations being made which are likely in the Anglosphere. But uh, quite apart from that, uh, you know, uh, the fact is that uh, there is going to be a resistance. Uh, the resistance may take some time. There will be a resistance against the repression that people are facing. You know, 20 years, Afghanistan has changed. The demography has changed. A new generation has come into being. This is not 1996, 2001. Uh, when Afghanistan was completely isolated, it's much better connected now. But what complicates the story are two things. One is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, that there are so many radical groups. You talk about the IS, but we shouldn't leave out the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the Chechens, the Dagestanis, the Etim, the LET, the Jaish e Mohammed, the Uyghurs, the Lashkar e Jangi, the, the anti Shia groups, the sectarian groups, the anti minority groups, the Jundullah. We have this entire constellation which have all been fighting in the trenches with the Taliban for this moment, to, for the occupation of Afghanistan. They are an alien force, an alien ideology. They have an Afghan face, but their brains are brainwashed by Pakistan, and there are Pakistani hands behind them. So now it's complicated by this sort of popuri, or let's call it a kind of a conglomerate of extreme forces, which will, which will fight for, uh, you know, for uh, the jihad, but will also simultaneously fight for the jihad inside the country, which is to remove all vestiges of what they call foreign occupation, uh, but also uh, who will fight amongst themselves. So the resistance we'll have to face, it's not just going to be resistance against the Taliban. It's a much more complicated picture that we will see. Gautam, I'm going to come back to you to ask about the specifically Indian perspective on, on what's happened in a second. But first to Rory. Rory, um, from the point of view of, of this country, Shazi has been very generous and thanked the British government for, for saving her. But do you feel this is a, one of the more shameful moments in our history, the way we've abandoned our allies? I think it's very, very sad. I think Britain has behaved badly. I think the United States has behaved very badly. It's partly an, uh, a revelation of British weakness. I mean, it turns out that actually Britain was really along for the ride and had 
a very limited capacity to operate independently. It didn't seem to be able to imagine even keeping quite a light footprint on the ground with German and French allies. You would have thought sustaining 2,500 soldiers should have been something easily within uh, the gift of the non-US bits of NATO with a little bit of US support. You didn't need American boots on the ground. So in a sense, the whole of NATO needs to share uh, in its humiliation and horror and not put it all on the United States, although it was, of course, Biden who pulled the rug out. Do you feel that with a, with a different leadership in Downing Street that it would have been possible for a, a, some sort of British force to stay in, in, in alliance with other NATO allies? Yes, if the uh, government had been serious about Afghanistan... Not and body surfing Afghanistan. on holiday. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's a sort of bigger, deeper problem than British foreign policy. I think it is true that I don't see the Boris Johnson government as a particularly serious government or particularly interested in foreign policy. But there's a deeper problem, which is that Britain is out of the habit of thinking about acting on its own or really taking responsibility for these events. Had they wanted to, two years ago, really taken seriously the possibility that Trump and Biden meant to do this, of course they could have worked with France, Germany, Turkey and others to bring together a force to replace the United States, and they perhaps could have asked Biden to leave certain enablers in place while he removed his troops. They didn't do that, and I think that shows the weakness of the alliance. But if I may, Willie, just, just one sort of bigger point, because um, obviously there are many people on the stage who don't have much time, but it seems that one of the central problems that we're now facing is around narratives about Afghanistan. So as Gautam has said, this is essentially a defeat for a particular democratic project. And what we're now seeing is many, many journalists, particularly in the United States, Anand Gopal, and increasing articles in the Washington Post and elsewhere, suggesting that the real Afghanistan is represented by the Taliban-dominated areas of the South. So they write about places like Sangin districts in Helmand, and they try to suggest that the Taliban victory has brought great benefits to those areas by bringing peace and ending a war, and essentially suggested that nothing was achieved in 20 years, that if you go to these rural areas, nothing had changed. I think this has to be challenged because the reality is many things changed in rural Afghanistan. Sangin is one of the most extreme difficult parts of the country, and it should not be used as a representation. Herat, uh, many of the areas around Maza, certainly Hazarajat, Bamiyan, uh, Shamali Plain, Panjshir Valley, huge progress in those rural areas. Life was immeasurably better than it was under the Taliban. And we cannot allow to remain unchallenged this narrative that somehow the only benefits of 20 years were felt in Kabul and that everything outside was some vision of hell. Before we go on to that very interesting question, I will come back to this. How long have we got, incidentally, B? Have we got uh, roughly 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. So, just a very brief answer. How tarnished is that whole project now of, of trying to promote d democracy? Is it dead in the water, this idea that we can come to a country that's had some tyrannical or insurgent force uh, and, and encourage them to, to go to the ballot box and, and, and have a liberal democracy? Is that idea which was so much put about after 9-11, is that dead in the water? I, I, I think so, but even worse, even the idea that we can do a humanitarian intervention of the sort that we did in Rwanda uh, what should have done in Rwanda and did in Bosnia is now basically dead in the water. So this is actually quite dangerous because there will be many places in sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel where there is an argument for the international community getting involved and there are useful things the international community can do if it approaches them sensibly and with a light footprint. The problem is that what we've revealed in our politics is we seem to either go in too hard, try to do too much, or we give up and do nothing at all. We've lost any sense of moderation. I'm going to, a very brief answer, and I'll take this then to, to Gautam again. Um, how far should, do you think history will look back on this as the end of America's imperium, that this great period when American bases were all over the world expanding after 9-11 has now changed to a period of Chinese hegemony, that, this is now, that Afghanistan is now going to become, uh, for all that, that it got this, this, this Mullah government, or Pashtun Mullah government in Kabul, but the real e development there is going to be done by, by China, it's going to be Belt and Road, we're going to see the Chinese extract mineral resources, and this whole era of American domination is over. Would you agree with that or not? Uh, yes, you know, actually when we talk to our American colleagues now, they uh, tend to go out of the way to say, America is not going anywhere, it's still there, and they hark back to Saigon and say, well, you know, since Saigon, America has been there and America will continue to be there. But, you know, when I look back, uh, and I was in the 
uh, this, the division that dealt with the Soviet Union when it cracked up. Uh, this, the, the, the departure of the Soviet troops led to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the entire Soviet bloc. I won't say that the departure of U.S. troops will lead to a similar, uh, you know, similar state, but definitely it will be a very wounded United States. Uh, it's already facing internal cha challenges, even challenges to its own democracy. Uh, and that was another reason why, in fact, it should have supported democracy elsewhere. Really? I see in the house. Yeah, sorry, let me, may I complete this? Please do. Uh, William. Yeah. Uh, but, and what we are seeing in its place, you know, that we had a certain alignment, which was a democratic Afghanistan, the United States, West, the democratic world, including India, during this entire 20 year reconstruction period. Now that is replaced by a Taliban supported by Pakistan, reinforced by China, and then the other powers that are aligned uh, around this, uh, Russia and Iran, can hardly be called, you know, let's say flag carriers of freedom, democracy, and, and liberty. Uh, so we see that, and we see in the Auskos actually a kind of fallback onto an Anglosphere. So there's a complete shrinking of demo democratic space and the authoritarian, dicta dictatorial. You have Myanmar on the other side uh, of the subcontinent. Uh, you basically see a kind of progress of the authoritarians or even uh, the populist democracies, uh, you know, the democracies that are tending towards the authoritarian. Thank you, Gautam. Rory, is this the, is this, you were born in Hong Kong, is this the, uh, now the, the, the period of Chinese hegemony that we've been seeing rising? Is this their moment now? I think it will feel very different. I don't think we can anticipate China being uh, drawn into nation building. I mean, China isn't interested in doing that. But I very much agree with Gautam's basic idea that something very strange has happened. Uh, authoritarianism and new forms of populism are now dominant and it's extraordinary. I mean, that movement, I mean, if you think about the movement from 1989 to about 2004, where the numbers of democracies in the world exploded uh, and then stalled and, and has now begun to go dramatically backwards. And that, that's not something that any of us really anticipated 15 years ago. And that's partly, of course, about the rise of China. I mean, in 2004, the British economy was still bigger than the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy is now seven times larger than the British economy, and that's happened in 16 years. That's an extraordinary figure. Saad, do you, do you see your, your television station staying open? What's the, what's the future for you and, and Moby? Uh, are you optimistic or not? Well, I'm not optimistic, and I'm, I'm also not pessimistic. Uh, as Gautam said, too many things can happen in, in the weeks ahead. Uh, there are too many unknowns. Uh, we continue and will continue, you know, whether it's from inside of Afghanistan, from outside of Afghanistan. The country, as Rory put it um, so well, has changed. The, the, you know, the, the, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, Afghanistan is a transformed country. That's why it's a bit disappointing to see the world uh, disengage because what was a stalemate to you was precious to us. People like Shazia was working. There are lots of other women going to university. And this youngest country outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, median age of 18, 65% under the age of 22 or 23, it's a different country. We just needed more time. Is it too late? I don't think so. But I think the world needs to continue to at least care. Shazia, what future do you see for your friends and, and, and family left in Afghanistan? Well, it's complicated. Just uh, you can observe the current situation in Afghanistan. Today, girls are banned. They are not allowed to go to the schools. So you can imagine that what will be their future in, in Afghanistan. And there's a, just one question that Afghan women want to ask from the world that do they deserve such a life in Afghanistan? Do they? So that's it. Yeah, thank you. Mukalika, uh, uh, Namaz, who himself has come out of, of Kabul in the, last, uh, uh, in the last few days. Can we have a, a, a microphone for Namaz? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Yamad Zafari. I'm a shivering scholar who made it this year with all the difficulties. Uh, I also came on the same day that Shazia came on uh, 24th of August with all crossing the barren gate and all the things. And, and you know, we're lucky because uh, after two days or a day after that, a blast happened. 
So you could imagine how we feel and how we made it. I would like to thank uh, Ruth Stewart for making it happen and uh, listening our voice and making this year happen for Shifting Scholars. So I would like to uh, owe him a big thanks. And uh, so my question is from Saad, uh, what is that that we are not learning? It's been 40 years in our country there is war. We have not learned what was our mistake. At least we need to learn what is our mistake. And our elders should tell us what is that that we are doing continuously wrong so that we should not do it again. And we convey that one message to our children so that they should not do that. You see, in 20 years, our leaders enjoyed the glory of a uh, state. The armored vehicles, the castles, everything, the VIP life. But you have seen the president was also the first one who fled the country. Though two months back he said, I will not abandon the army, I will not abandon the country, I will not abandon the nation. But he was the first one who abandoned. And uh, Shaza, you rightly said about the women education. It's not about women, it's about 50% of your population who are women. So it means 50% will know more development. As a father, if you ask me, I mean, it's a tactical thing they're pitching in that preliminary schooling will be there, it means at, uh, until class six, and no more schooling will be there. That means automatically saying no to education, because of, if, if my girl studies until six, she would love to continue the education and, and uh, doing bachelor and master. So that means how will I tell her when she is, will be 11 or 12 that you, you should not go to school anymore? It's really too difficult. So tactically, they're bringing, uh, you know, finishing the value of Afghans. 50% of your women, your population cannot join. They just changed the ministry name, Ministry of Women Affairs. You could see your representation is more, no more there. So that is the scenario. Come the, the Ministry of Vice and Virtue now. Yeah, you see. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, the discussion was on, on democracy. I mean, your best partner who were you is, after 20 years, they're saying that we're not there for nation state building. So one of the pillars of the democracy is nation state building option. They say we're there for you know, military intervention. Let's get Saad's answer. So what is Afghanistan doing wrong? Uh, well, I, I think uh, we don't have enough time to discuss all the things that went wrong. But <laughs> obviously corruption and the ineptitude of the, of the state didn't help. I think the heavy handedness of the, of the US military um, uh, didn't help. Um, the drone strikes, the, the drone strikes, the, the air strikes, um, and I think that there was a real disconnect between the the state and the people. Um, as uh, I think you pointed out, uh, President Karzai was a lot more connected, but Ashraf Ghani in particular had no idea. He never. I once asked him. I said, "Do you do you watch the news?" He goes, "I don't have enough time to watch the news." He said, "But I get the transcripts." I said, "But you don't get the emotions of a mother screaming because her son has been killed." You, and President Kazai, the interesting thing was that he would ask, this is before YouTube, he'd ask for DVDs of programs, of the news stories, as people would call us up and would deliver it to the, to the palace. But we all made mistakes, including us. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge um, all these things. And it's, we're going to have plenty of time for post-mortems to, to see as to what we did wrong. And sadly, this government is already doing things wrong, this new government. Lady at the back, where are you? There <laughs> we go. Very good. Sorry. Oh, um, my name is Aisha Khan, and I was in Kabul shortly after the fall of the Taliban, at the time when they were establishing the interim government. And I recall, and I'm not sure if this was hearsay or if it was fact, but I do recall that Zahir Shah had come to Afghanistan during that time. And I wonder from my Afghan friends and colleagues what they what they think if the West had engaged Zahir Shah at that time, who was known... This is the king, yes? The king, yeah. yes. So do you want to answer that? What, what would have happened if we'd brought back the royalty? Well, I mean, uh, I know his grandsons, we know the family very well. Uh, they're not the most competent people either. So a royal system, and not, I'm not an anti-monarchist or anything, um, uh, but I don't think it would have worked in Afghanistan. He was a wonderful human being. He was in his 90s. He was a true patriot. Uh, he was a good, I mean, symbolic figure, and that's what he remained till his death. I don't think that would have been the solution either. Moin, last question for you. We've got just two minutes. The truth uh, is that the Taliban is there, you know, for, for, for some time now. 
do they have any sense of a vision? What are they going to do next? Do they have a strategy in place? Uh, they are reaching out economically to China, to, to the, I think even to people in Geneva. But is there, uh, you know, in your minds, what would be the next steps that the Taliban would take to at least keep this country, you know, united or, or in some form uh, take the first steps to progress? What, what do you think are the next steps? Uh, just, just on the economic stuff, because we've got the political crisis and the humanitarian crisis. We have a major drought, uh, six, seven hundred thousand displaced individuals uh, inside the country. The world gave Afghanistan eight and a half to nine billion dollars last year. That works out to be about twenty-five or thirty million dollars a day. The Taliban have no idea what this economic crisis is going to look like. They get excited because the Chinese have given them fifteen million dollars in, in kind, not in cash, in kind. That's going to last us half a day. So even, you know, I explained to one of these pro-Taliban sympathizers, the six and a half billion dollar TAPI project, the gas pipeline project between Turkmenistan and India, once it's completed, six and a half billion dollars is gonna generate two, two to three hundred million dollars a year for the, for the Afghan state. It's nothing. I don't think they quite realize what they're facing. They're not sophisticated, they're not uh, worldly, uh, they're arrogant. They have just prevailed. They've beaten the, the uh, you know world power, superpower, the superpower, and no one's going to fill that vacuum. And the tragedy is that they're not going to pay the price. It's the Afghan people going to pay the price. Gautam, just a thirty-second answer, just to finish. We are an Indian festival. What is the hopes of Indian relations with Afghanistan um, uh, now? I mean, uh, do you have relations with the Taliban, or is it now a question of, of starting again from scratch? Uh, pretty much starting from, from scratch. Actually, so far the contacts have been purely limited to security issues. Uh, I see the world actually resigned to the fate of Afghanistan. And, you know, the world is by and large talking about engagement. Uh, I feel that uh, whatever engagement should be there should be minimal and basically focused on the people to people contact, humanitarian uh, effort uh, for the people of Afghanistan. I wouldn't interrupt trade because I think that also is an important component but relations with the government at an absolute minimum. minimum, And most of it negotiated and done through the United Nations. Thank you very much. Oh, there is one more question. Online from Grace Lee. Thank you, um, thank you for this session. What can British citizens do to help those in Afghanistan? What can British citizens do to help those in Afghanistan? Shazia. Just raise your voice for Afghan people, please. You can do everything for Afghan people now they are in Afghanistan. They really need your support, please. I really those, mean it. So to those who say to break relations and to punish the Taliban by cutting off aid, is that a mistake? Well, I don't know, but uh, uh, I can't say, but, but just now what they need, Afghan people, they really need support from the world. We really, they are humans. They just, they want a normal life just you guys have. They, they need so to we're, survive we're there in Afghanistan, yeah. Rory. Rory, was that you? Can I move very quickly on this? I, I think it's central not to be naive about the Taliban, not to embrace the Taliban, but at the same time understand that we need to get development and humanitarian assistance into ordinary Afghan people. It would be madness and very cruel to punish ordinary Afghans in the mistaken belief that was somehow going to change the behavior of the Taliban themselves. It is perfectly possible to find a way of providing support to the Afghan economy without being naive about the Taliban, and we should do that. Thank you very much. I think this is exactly why we have JLF. This extraordinary uh, uh, panel today was one of the very best, best sessions we've ever had. Gautam, thank you. Thank you, Rory. Saad, and, and particularly Shazia, welcome to, welcome to London. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you for a fantastic uh, discussion. What a privilege to hear such a variety of perspectives and voices, but ultimately I think the message is, is the same. Uh, support the Afghan people uh, without condoning or legitimizing the Taliban. I think that's, that's the message. But now uh, it remains for me on behalf of Teamwork Arts, JLF, 
uh, to thank you all and to thank our fantastic panelists for an amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.